Church family, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, I want to invite you to find your place in Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel. And this morning we're looking at Mark chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 18 and following. And I'm speaking this morning on the subject of Bible study tips from Jesus. Bible study tips from Jesus. In the passage before us, uh, Jesus has a confrontation, kind of an intense interaction with a group known as the Sadducees. So the first century group of religious and political people. In Mark's gospel in chapter number 12, Jesus is in the Holy Week in Jerusalem and the cross is approaching. And as he is visiting Jerusalem for this special occasion, many of the religious and political leaders of his day are confronting him, trying to discredit him, trying to embarrass him, and even trying to get him to say something incriminating, blasphemous, so that they might have him put to death. If you were to study Mark's gospel, you would see around this passage, Mark eleven eighteen, 18, Mark eleven twenty seven 27 through 28, and Mark 12, 13, various religious and political groups confront our Lord, trying to trip him up in his words. And here we see a group we call the Sadducees. They had great political power in the first century world. They were closely aligned with Rome. Therefore, they detested anyone who challenged Roman authority. As a result, they were obviously hostile to Jesus because just a few verses earlier in Mark chapter 11, verse number one, during the triumphal entry, A mob of people gathered to worship Jesus and they said, hallelujah to the one who comes in the name of David. They regarded Jesus, the populace did, the general populace that regarded Jesus as being the promised Messiah. And so the Sadducees were greatly concerned because Rome helped them retain their positions of power. Rome made the Sadducees prosperous. This is a political group, religious faction in the first century that had a lot of political power. They're also a group that had a religion that was a little bit different. They were different than the Pharisees. The Pharisees had a high regard of Scripture. In fact, in one way, their regard was too high because they became, the Pharisees, kind of legalistic in how they approached Scripture. They had created this volume called the Mishnah that contained all types of code and ethics invented by men, added on to Scripture to help people be faithful in fulfilling Scripture. The Sadducees were different from the Pharisees and the Sadducees maintained a more liberal perspective when it came to the Word of God. The Sadducees only regarded the first five books of the Bible as being authoritative. They only read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They regarded the miracles as being untrue. They called into question miracles, and they didn't believe in the existence of angels. We see this rich, politically powerful, and religiously liberal group in our passage before us this Lord's Day, approaching Jesus, trying to ensnare him, being critical of his teaching, and trying to get him to say something dumb so that they could potentially have him arrested. And as Jesus responds to his critics, and Jesus gives otherworldly, heavenly insight about how one should approach God, and how one should approach Scripture, the Bible, the Word of God. Jesus' words here in this response remind us that in order to be spiritually strong, each and every one of us need to have wisdom from God concerning how we should read, study, and apply God's Word. Jesus' words here remind us as believers that we must have the Word of God as an authority for our lives. If we, like the Sadducees, ever make our political affiliation more important than the Word of God, we're in spiritual trouble. If we, like the Sadducees, ever make our pocketbooks, our bank accounts more important than the Word of God, we are destined for spiritual shipwreck. We have to be on guard, to make the Word of God our authority. And we have to know how to come as God's people 
honestly and humbly to the word of God, allowing it to speak in our lives and allowing it to be the standard for our entire faith and practice. Sadducees erred in this regard, so Jesus in our passage corrected them. Now I want us to look at Jesus' interaction with this group this morning and try to discern how we can be better students of Scripture. Well, I believe what this world needs now is a people who are submitted to the truth of God. What the world needs now is a people who can lovingly say, thus saith the Lord. What the world needs now is people, chosen remnant, whose minds and hearts and lives are filled not with what's going on in social media, not with what's going on in the political world, not with what's going on in the news. What we need now are hearts and minds and lips that are devoted to God's word. Jesus, when he prayed for us, said, sanctify them by your truth, Lord. Your word is truth, John 17, 17. How can we be strong in Scripture? What Bible study tips can we get from Jesus this morning? Number one, I would give you this, don't pick and choose. Don't pick and choose when it comes to the word of God. The Sadducees were bad about this. What do you mean, pastor? I remember when I was in, attended a junior college in State University System of Georgia in Barnesville, Georgia. Lived with my grandfather. Cool thing about living with grandfather is food, free room and board. Number two, free food. Uh, Papa would take me many Friday nights up the road, down the road, to a little town called Milner in between Griffin and Barnesville. In Milner, Georgia, there was a famous restaurant called The Lighthouse. Don't that just sound good? Doesn't that just sound good? Lighthouse on Friday night had all-you-can-eat seafood buffet, boiled pill and eat shrimp, popcorn shrimp, fried shrimp, butterfly shrimp, (laughs) shrimp scampi, fried fish of all sorts. Had really good macaroni and cheese, too. Never understood on that buffet, they had that gross concoction that is famous of mixed vegetables. Uh, Who in the world, when all that is available, would want steamed cauliflower, broccoli, and carrots? There it was. Many times it was passed over in favor of all of the fried seafood. Y'all feel me this morning? Now, when it comes to God's word, some people have a similar approach. They pass over some things that seem more difficult to swallow, and they, with great joy, hold on to the specially chosen things that they enjoy and like. The Sadducees were guilty of this. They like to pick certain verses to support their political aspirations and their desires for prosperity. They like to pick certain verses to support their own theological views. Now look at verse number 18 in your Bible if you have it before you. It says, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and questioned him. Here we see one of the problems with the Sadducees' belief system. They were of a liberal persuasion. They didn't take all of the word of God seriously. As a result, they denied the existence of angels and they denied the reality of the resurrection. They didn't believe that God had the power to raise people back to life for eternal life. They denied the resurrection. They approached Jesus here in verse number 19. They said, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife behind but no child, that man should take the wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, they refer here to a passage in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. Notice what some religious people can do. Some religious people, though their heart is not fully for God, seem to be real skilled, buffet approach, real skilled at taking a verse out of context and using it to support their own preference and their own pet agenda. Sadducees did this. They referenced Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, trying to discredit the truth of the resurrection. They cherry-picked isolated one verse out of context for their own pet agenda. Now, indeed, this was a verse of Scripture, and it was very important. 
You see God and his grace and mercy because our God is a loving God. Years ago through Moses, he gave Holy Spirit inspired scripture to help widows in ancient times. Because in ancient times, there were no 401ks. There were no life insurance policies. Women could not enter into the workforce. To be without a husband was to be of the most destitute condition. And one had to have a husband many times just to survive, to eke out a living. So God, because he loves humankind in his word, gave a law for the Israelites concerning how to take care of widows. We see this law played out in Ruth, the book of Ruth, Ruth 4, 1 through 17. Even before this law was given in the word of God, we see precedent for it in Genesis 38 in the case of Tamar. Regardless here, notice what the Sadducees do. They, in an attempt to support their denial of the miraculous, their denial of God's power, and their denial of the resurrection, they, in their attempt to discredit the very Son of God, take one verse out of context, twist its meaning, quote it, and they use it to promote their own agenda. They stand as an example for us. If you want to be strong in Scripture and if you really want to understand God's Word, you can't take verses out of context. There's an old saying, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. As a pastor, many times I interact with people in the church or people in the community, and every once in a while somebody's got a bone to pick, and they'll say, well, doesn't the Bible say somewhere something like this? It's easy for us to take one verse and use it to support our own pet agenda, our own preferences our own political persuasion. Let's be careful. Let's not have a buffet or smorgasbord approach. Instead, let's go to the entirety of God's word and allow it to be the standard. And let's seek to understand verses. Even as I'm trying to help us understand these verses this morning, let's aim to understand particular verses within the context of all of scripture. You gotta have your eye on the entire Bible. Genesis through Revelation. If you want the Bible to unleash its life-changing power in your life. So you see, number one this morning, don't pick and choose. Number two, I'd say this, focus on God's ideas. Focus on God's ideas, not your own. Focus on God's ideas, not your own. We see that the Sadducees had this problem that they approach Jesus not with a focus on his ideas or God's ideas. Instead, they come to Jesus with an agenda, with presuppositions, with first their own ideas. Look at verse number 20, how the story continues. They say there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and dying left no offspring. The second also took her and he died leaving no offspring. And the third, likewise, none of the seven left offspring. Last of all, the woman died too. And the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be since the seven had married her? Now, we see the Sadducees here bringing an absurd, extreme example to Jesus. Many believe that the Sadducees had used this example, this argument, time and time again with their opponents. Whenever they engaged in religious debates with Pharisees, they loved to pull out this story. It wasn't scriptural, but they liked to use it because it could help them win an argument. Many times they stumped Pharisees who stood in silence. Pharisees many times had no response to this, this argument. And here they use this extreme example. The world of logic and debate, this is known as a reductio ad absurdum, an absurd argument to try to win a point. Aristotle in his work prior analytics spoke of this technique. And here the Sadducees employ it on Jesus. But Jesus, instead of engaging in their earthly arguments, goes straight to Scripture. He means to expose his opponents for being too earthly-minded for any heavenly good. Look at verse number 24, how Jesus responded. Jesus spoke to them and said, isn't this the reason why you're mistaken? 
You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Take note, church, of Jesus' indictment. Problem with the Sadducees is they were focused on their ideas, human argumentation, man-centered debate. Not only did they not know all the answers, they didn't even know all the questions. They were on the completely wrong, wrong wavelength. Jesus was seeking to help people understand Scripture. Go back to Mark chapter 1 when the Bible spoke of people's response to Jesus' first teaching in the synagogue, Mark chapter 1. It says the people stood in amazement. They were astonished because Jesus, when he spoke, spoke as one with authority. While others quoted men, while others relied on tradition, Jesus spoke from the Word of God. Many times in Mark's gospel when Jesus taught, he over and over again used these three words, it is written. Here was the folly of the Sadducees. They were focused on their own ideas, not God's. And Jesus tells them, verse number 24, you're mistaken. You're mistaken. Language spoke of one being led astray, one who was made to wander. The Greek word underlying the English translations there for mistaken is a word from which we get our word planet. Now, Jesus didn't, and Mark didn't think of planets in the way we think of them, maybe, but Jude in Jude 1 13 did use this same word as a metaphor to describe false teachers in the first century, and he described them as wandering stars. And here's what one happens when one becomes untethered, unhinged from Scripture. One is like a shooting star, wandering with culture, wandering with news reports, wandering with the opinions and the morals of fallen humanity. Be careful, church, when, you are fo- when we are focused on our own ideas and not God's ideas, we will shift and change with culture. Jesus encourages us here to be strong in the Scriptures. He charged the Sadducees with not knowing the Scriptures. You see, if they would have studied all the Scriptures and been honest and humble before the Word of God, they would have read things like in 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24. They would have read the story of how Elijah raised a widow's son from the dead, and they would have known that God can raise the dead. If they would have truly and honestly with humility spent time reading the Word of God, if they would have made the, made the precepts of God's Word more important than political things, they would have known, according to 2 Corinthians 13, 21, that God can raise the dead. They would have heard that story how after Elijah had died, Elijah's bones were placed in a tomb. And on one occasion, Folks accidentally, by happenstance, threw a body into Elijah's tomb, and when that body, that dead body, touched Elisha's bones, that dead body came to life. Resurrection, according to Scripture, was possible. Even Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14, in the Valley of Dry Bones story, taught that the resurrection is indeed a real thing. The Sadducees didn't know this because they were too focused on their own ideas. They needed to hear the words of Isaiah. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, where the Lord said through the prophet, my thoughts are not your thoughts and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration for as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Oh, church, this morning, Know this, if you want to be spiritually strong, if Tabernacle Baptist is going to be a light in the darkness, we need a deep devotion to our Lord and to his truth. We've got to be more concerned about God's ideas than man's ideas. And remember the warning of Paul in one of his letters to the Corinthians. He told us that the wisdom of man is foolishness in God's sight. There's a lot of folks nowadays trying to fit the Word of God into their own agenda, more focused on their ideas than God's ideas. I think of it like a recent internet phenomenon I've seen regarding cats. How many of y'all are cats people? How many of y'all have cats? All right. 
Give some love for the cats people. How many of y'all are dogs people? That's what I thought. See, when you get saved and Jesus comes into your heart, you you like dogs more than cats, right? I only remember having one cat growing up. The cat's name was Kitty. See, we didn't didn't think much of cats. I mean, you didn't take much time naming it. All right, you're Kitty. Put a lot of work into naming a dog. That's important. But I've seen this recently online that uh, cats have a tendency. Now, I don't know this because, again, didn't have a lot of cats growing up. But cats have a tendency to, to like to fit into tight spaces. There's actually a lot of pictures going on in the Internet, going around the Internet, of cats uh, fitting into tight spaces. You got some of them here? All right. Let's see the next one. Yeah, there you go. That's my favorite right there. All right. There you go. All right, and make sure you don't eat the fruit salad out of that bowl at supper, all right? So you can see uh, these cats trying to fit into tight spaces. Many people have a similar approach when it comes to the word of God. Instead of reading it with humility and honesty and saying, what does the Lord have to say to my life? And then instead try to make it fit into their system, their agenda, their persuasion, and their preferences. Paul said in Romans, let God be true and let every man be a liar. And it's my desire to approach the word of God in such a way. Lord, help me to focus on your ideas and not man's ideas. And number three, how else can we understand the word of God? How can we be strong in scripture? How can we as individuals be transformed by the truth of God? How can we be a bright, vibrant, growing church? How can our families be strong for the Lord? How can we be used by God with his truth to make a difference in this world? Number three, ask God to help you understand. If you want to understand the Bible, if you want to be strong in scripture, if you want life transformation through God's word, Have a commitment to ask God to help you understand. Many times I'll go into my Bible reading just as I did this morning, and I can't just launch in reading. I have to take a moment to say, Lord, before I read, I just want to say, you know the needs of my soul. You know this morning, Lord, what I need to hear. Oh, God, I just don't want to skim over words. Please speak to me. Please give me a blessing. Please encourage me. Please convict me of something that needs a change in my life. Help this time to be meaningful. See, I understand this according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, verse 27. When you get saved, when you're born again, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live within you. The Holy Spirit of God, according to John, 1 John 2, 27, serves to illuminate your thinking to the truth of God. You have, according to John 15 and 16, through the third person of the Trinity, an inner helper and an inner guide within your soul. And as you read scripture, as you seek to discern truth, you have one, as Jesus said to his disciples, who will recall all things to your mind. You have one who can make you understand deep and mysterious things from the word of God. Now, the Sadducees were not acquainted with such Holy Spirit power. It was indeed before Pentecost, but at the same time, they didn't have any power from God. They didn't rely on any power from God to help them understand the scriptures. Look at how Jesus indicted them at the end of verse 24. He said, you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. The word power is a very important word. We can think of it in two regards here. Number one, we can think of the way in which the Sadducees denied the power of God through denying the resurrection. See, they were of that liberal theological persuasion where they were perhaps too sophisticated to think that God could raise someone from the dead. Can you hear them? I've heard folks argue like this before. Well, I believe a lot of things in the Bible. There's a lot of good moral teachings, a lot of good insight. But I don't really believe that miracle stuff. Friends, can I remind you this morning, if you believe there is a creator, if you believe there's a God, it's not too hard to believe in miracles. If God really at the beginning of time said, let there be light, if he really fashioned this earth upon which we live, it's not that big of a deal for him to raise someone from the dead. Parting the waters, the Red Sea, is indeed a miraculous feat. It's not too hard for the Lord 
Is anything impossible for God? The resounding answer is no. And the Sadducees were guilty of denying the power of God through denying the resurrection, but there's something else to be seen here. The Lord is correcting the Sadducees for the way in which they didn't trust in the power of God to help them understand the Word of God. You, you see, the Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians 4.20 that the kingdom of God is not, not a matter of talk, but of power. The Bible warns us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, about being people who have a form of godliness while denying its power. You see, Jesus reminds us here, and he reminded the Sadducees, Jesus teaches us here of our need as we approach the Word of God, as we approach Scripture, to rely on the power of God to give us wisdom, to enlighten our thinking, to lead us in his truth. To correct us, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for instruction, for reproof, and for correction. As you go into your Bible study, make sure you rely on the help of the Holy Spirit. Don't approach the Word of God like you got it all figured out. Don't approach it like you're the Bible answer man or the Bible answer woman. Don't go to, your, to the Word of God with your grid and all your presuppositions. Go to the Word of God and say, Lord, speak. And Holy Spirit, help me to understand your truth. Remember, you came from dust and you'll one day return to the dust. Though the Lord will raise your body, you are a mere finite, imperfect human being. You don't have all the answers. You don't have it figured out. You need God to speak truth. Number four, we'll lastly, we'll say this. One last tip. You all ready for it? Say amen. You not sure? Say oh me. Okay, all right, you're with me. Okay, number four, I'd give you this piece of advice from Jesus. Bible study tips from Jesus. Make the Bible your lens. Make your, the Bible your lens. Now, I'm excited about this weather today, aren't y'all? I got my Ray-Ban sunglasses ready to wear later on. Go out there in that sunshine and have something to filter the sunlight from hurting my eyes. When you get older, like 42, like I am, real old, right? You, younger people, you'll see the need for sunglasses. I used to wonder, why do all these old people wear sunglasses? Now, I know the sun can hurt your eyes. I didn't think about that much when I was younger. So I have those lenses to filter the sun before it hits my eyes. Know this, as you go to the Bible, as you seek to discern truth in life, you need to allow the Bible to be a lens through which you see the world. Look at how Jesus spoke to the Sadducees about this. Look at verse 26 in your Bible, follow along with me. It said, Jesus continued and he said, as for the dead being raised, haven't you read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush, how God said to him, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then Jesus concludes, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, you are badly mistaken. Now, notice Jesus. Man, if you could go read Mark sometime. I mean, maybe make it your project this week to read through the Gospel of Mark. Jesus, again, throughout Mark, many times, though he is the Son of God, he doesn't say, well, I believe. Though he is the Son of God, Jesus, you never find him saying, well, so-and-so said. Jesus, though he was the embodiment of all of the wisdom of God never appealed to his own authority while ministering to earth. He often said, it is written. He appealed to the scriptures. And he does this same thing here for us. He's 100% God, 100% man, but as a man, he makes sure to appeal to scripture to show us mere men and women that as we seek to live the Christian life, we should make sure we are referencing scripture and basing our beliefs and our convictions on scripture. Oh, be careful when you spout your opinion if you can't put the Bible behind it. Oh, we got a world that'll let you get away with it, right? Go put your comments online. You don't need to put any scripture. Jesus, notice our Lord, 
He submitted himself, Philippians 2, 5 through 10, to do the will of the Father. And he doesn't speak from his own prerogative or position. He speaks from the word of God, modeling that we should have such an approach. And he quotes a passage from Exodus chapter 3. Y'all perhaps know that story. Do you remember when the Lord wanted to fulfill all of his land promises to the Israelites? They were slaves in Egypt. There was a Pharaoh who didn't remember Joseph. And the Lord wanted to deliver the Israelites from Egypt into Canaan. And he anointed a man named Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. But before Moses stood in Pharaoh, Moses stood before a burning bush that was not consumed by fire. The Lord said, Moses, get the sandal off your foot. The place where you're standing is holy ground. I'm selecting you to lead my people to the land I promised to your ancestors. The Lord appealed to this passage of Scripture when confronting the Sadducees because he knew they regarded it as Scripture. They only regarded the first five books of the Bible as Scripture. So Jesus played along with them and he took a verse out of the books that they had a high view of and he quoted it. And in that passage, the Lord said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Did you know how to notice how the Lord spoke of his relationship to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of Israel's forefathers? He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. He didn't say, I used to be the God of Isaac. He didn't say, way back in history, I was the God of Jacob. No, the Lord, Jesus wanted the Sadducees to see this. The Lord said, I am present tense right now in the process of being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is, as the Lord was on earth revealing himself to Moses, he was also in heaven with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at that very moment in his presence. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not overcome by the death. They were not overcome by the grave. They were raised to live, hallelujah, forever in the presence of God. The power of God is real. The resurrection is true. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. And Jesus corrected the Sadducees with biblical truth. And Jesus demonstrated that we as believers, if we want to understand God's word rightly, need to let the Bible be our lens. We need to have the humble disposition of the psalmist who said in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible needs to be our guide, our standard, our source of authority. We should approach it with an open mind, an open heart, a humble disposition. It should be our lens, kind of like I'll put those sunglasses on later, the Bible should be the lens through which we see the world. A lens can make a real powerful difference, can it not? I remember taking uh, high school biology, confession, biology, chemistry, science, those weren't my best subjects. You could get my transcript from that junior college in Barnesville, Georgia, and think, wow, pastor really struggled in those classes. Words and languages were more my thing. But I remember one thing I really enjoyed in biology and in some of my science classes is when we got to use a microscope. Did y'all ever do this? Now, if you could ever get the thing in focus, then it would help. You know, I remember just sliding stuff under. I don't see anything. What are they talking about? Uh, recently, I found a picture online of a, an ant. Uh, there's an ant. Hold on the second picture, please, for a moment. Anybody know what type of ant this is? Feedback from the crowd? All right, I don't know, it's an ant. All right, okay. You want to see that bad boy up close? All right, go ahead and show us the second picture of that right there. There he is, under a microscope. Almost looks like a dragon, right? Looks like that dragon off of The Hobbit. Hey, a lens can make a big difference. And get this in your life, believer. If you approach God, life, religion, family, finances, anxiety, your emotions, all of life with the filter of God's word. 
you'll be in a lot better place to grow spiritually. You'll be well positioned to experience more of the freedom, joy, and abundance that Christ offers. Like the psalmist, let his word be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path.